cooked cubed potatoes, and then we'll get them on these trays. All right, so I got these drained. And we'll just get some poured out on there. Try to get most of them on the tray. Because I wanted to get about two and a half pounds. And it's probably going to end up a little bit less. So I'm going to start with that. Okay, then I'm going to get one of these stainless steel pieces in there, just between some pieces. It's not going to actually be in a potato, but it'll be better than not having it. Okay, so those go in the freezer for pre-freezing, and then we'll get them in the freeze dryer later. I'm going to let them cool a little bit because they're piping hot, so I'm not going to put them in the freezer until they cool a little bit more. We're going to get the potatoes that we cubed yesterday and put in the freezer for pre-freezing. Now today we're going to get them into the freeze dryer for drying. Uh, the potato cubes work out really nice for a lot of different things. For one thing, you can just mash them afterwards, but we can also use them for potato salad or other kind of potatoey things. So let's get them weighed and in the freeze dryer. When we'd loaded the trays, we tried to get two and a half pounds, but they were still warm and so steam would have been coming off and we would have lost a bit of the weight. So 1863, so we might end up with a little less than two and a half pounds per tray unless we decide to just call it two and a half pounds because that's what it would take to get it back to what it was beforehand. Oh, I forgot to take that out. Dug on it. So that's going to affect the weight. Okay, I need to get this out before we weigh it. And then we'll put a thermometer in its place. 1849, 1848. And then we'll just slip a thermometer in where that uh, rod was. Okay. 1842. 1843. 1852. Those are ready for the freeze dryer. So you can probably see a little bit of a difference between these two trays and these two trays. These two, the potatoes were cooked a little bit more and these were a little bit underdone or just barely done because I want to try potato salad with these. These will probably end up getting mashed uh, or hash browns or something. But anyway, uh, I wasn't really worried about that. The freeze dryer has been pre-cooling for about 35 minutes, 40 minutes. Uh, however, it had never been really warmed because we were doing a little test with some candy earlier. So the chamber was already cold. That's why I decided I was going to put these in tonight, even though I was planning on waiting until tomorrow. But the chamber is very cold. Uh, the walls of the chamber are lower than 35. It's showing negative 5 on the display. And so it's colder than the food that we're putting in, and that's what I like to have. I don't like to put cold food in a warm freeze dryer and have it melt in there. Okay, oh, and I can't put this in. Doggone it. All right, we do have a good seal around there, but I did notice just from the little testing we did, Without having that disc in there, I get condensation on the front, and without having that silver bubble wrap stuff around the outside of the seal, I get water coming off of here. I haven't had to deal with that in years because of that disc and the silvery stuff. You probably saw in an earlier video, I took this seal off my sister's machine and we're trying some repair on it. And then this is the seal off mine from six and a half years, or the one that I've been using for six and a half years. I have these layers of this silverized bubble wrap stuff on here to keep the warm air away from that cold seal and causing all that condensation. Really does a great job. And boy, when it's not here, I sure miss it. I also want to mention weighing. The weighing of the food on the trays is not required. You don't have to weigh 
to freeze dry except the weight check uh, to make sure that it's dry. The dry check by using a scale is a great way to tell if the entire batch is dry. There's no guesswork that way. It's either stopped losing weight or it hasn't stopped losing weight. But as far as weighing them to know how much food you have, you don't have to. But if you want to know how much food you have, it's a good idea to weigh them. And then if you want to be able to get the rehydration the same later, that could be useful. It's certainly not required and lots of foods will just basically absorb what it needs. But if you have too much water and you end up having to drain it, well then you're going to also be losing some of the nutrients that are going to go out into that water. So if I'm making soup for instance and I want to put the potatoes in it or a stew, I want to know how much water needs to go in with those potatoes to get the potatoes back to what they were. So then I can adjust my recipe for that amount of dry ingredient added to it so that I don't have to pre-rehydrate them and I don't have any extra liquid that I have to drain away. But is it required? Absolutely not. The thermometers in the trays, absolutely not required, but really, really useful. When I'm getting close to the end of the cycle, it will tell me are all four trays actually up to temperature. They need to make it up to the temperature that's set for the tray, which, and I have it set for 120 degrees right now. It needs to reach that 120, and it needs to stay up at that 120 in the middle layer of the food for hours to make sure that all of the secondary drying has been done. All of the liquid water, all of the ice that you can find, that's just the primary drying. After that's gone, there's another step, the secondary drying. And the thermometers will tell me whether or not it's in that phase. And again, you don't need it, but if it's 10 at night and the machine is telling me it's almost finished, and I look at the thermometers in there and I see that it says it's only 20 degrees, I know it's not almost finished, so I can just add time and never stop and check it. If it finishes while I'm not here, I don't want to take them out to check them or to bag them if those are 40 below. Because the instant I let that air in, the moisture from that air is going to condense on that food. Now I've just added water to the food. The thermometers tell me, are they warm enough to safely take out? If they're not above 70 or 80 degrees, I know that it's not warm enough to take out safely. So thermometers are not required. Weighing them is not required. Except for, again, I would say the dry check process of weighing them. And that you don't even have to record. We did that on a scratch paper for years until people asked about the data and then we started keeping all that data. But those are pieces that are definitely not required and are really, really useful once you get used to the idea of it. And it only takes a few seconds. I'm going to let this continue freezing. It will start the main cycle in about uh, five and a half hours. And then it will be done in about two days. So don't go away, it'll be just a second. We're back to check the potato cubes. It's been about 42, almost 43 hours. And uh, it said that it should have been done over six hours ago, but I was busy doing other stuff. And I think it was wrong six hours ago because the thermometers were still below the set point of the trays. So the highest thermometer still hadn't made it to 100 degrees and they're set for 120 degrees. To finish driving off the last of the moisture, it has to get up to the temperature and hold it for a period of time. If you just get it till it's warm and then take it out, you've finished the primary drying, but you haven't necessarily finished all the secondary drying. Now the thermometers are, the, the middle two are over 120, the outside two are over 100, uh, about 115 and about 100 degrees on this one. So they may or may not be done. The top and bottom are usually cooler. And so now we're gonna switch them and start the dry check. If the food is pretty resistant to giving off the moisture, like blueberries, cherries, 
especially whole blueberries, whole cherries, citrus, things that have those little cell structures with the little envelopes around them. They don't like to give off their moisture. They take more time and I give them a longer dry check. For some of these kinds that are fairly open and porous like potatoes when they're cooked, uh, a two hour dry check should be enough. So it just depends on if I can get back here in two hours or not. It's still showing two hours of the added time and I'm going to go ahead and down arrow past that. And it also says that the vacuum is at 140 right now in case we're keeping track. Okay, we'll open the drain valve. I'm also making sure that any fans are turned off right now while I do the weight check because, well, let me angle it down here in just a second. We'll get tray one out. It's at 965. So you notice my old machine doesn't have a metal bottom inside. It has a rail system under it. And so the air from the condensing fan gets pulled through the condenser and it just goes everywhere. Well, I found out that when this is on the scale, if I don't have this foam here and I have this table this height, air comes out here and actually lifts up on the tray and lowers the uh, scale number by two or three grams. So it gives me a false reading. And I've also found out if this, a ceiling fan is on above this, it can raise the reading by two or three grams. So it's important on this sensitive of weighing that I take into account fans. Tray two, 957. As I said, I'm going to switch these two because this tray is noticeably warmer in this spot. Yeah, this one's at least 10, 15 degrees cooler. So switching those two, and then of course I'll switch these two also. So tray three, nine, six, one, and tray four, nine, six, eight. And then tray four is going to go up here, and tray three is going to go down here. Okay, we'll get that closed. We've been rotating our trays almost since the beginning because we noticed that there were differences in temperatures. But a viewer pointed out that I'd mentioned that the middle two are warmer and the, the top and bottom are a little bit lower with the bottom one being a little lower than the top one. Well, at first we were just rotating the top one to the bottom one, bottom one to the top one. So essentially uh, we weren't doing much because those are only a couple of degrees apart. It's the middle two that were considerably warmer. And so a viewer said, well, why aren't you switching those bottom two? So three and four and one and two. Well, so that's what we started doing. Makes much more sense. As I mentioned earlier, when we were putting these in, weighing is not required. Thermometers are not required. There is a meter that I would love to have for a water activity meter. Uh, it's made by, I can't remember the name, I'll put a, a I'll, I'll write it down here or up here or something. I've had viewers ask if it's possible to over freeze dry your food. Well, technically it kind of is because there is an optimum amount how low you should go to keep it at the best possible texture for the future. The differences will be really a textural difference. You're, you're not really going to be losing uh, extra nutrients or anything like that. It just might, might not be quite as good of a, a mouthfeel when it's rehydrated. I don't care. If you're doing it commercially, it would be much more important because if you over dry, if you over dry, you're spending extra money to get it extra dry and you're losing product weight. So if you're selling it by pound, if you had 100,000 pounds of, of jerky and you dried it to, well, you've dried it down to 100,000 pounds, but you've over dried it by a few percent, uh, that's extra money in time, effort, and lost product that you could have sold. 
So in those cases, having that expensive meter would be well worth it. But it also takes time. And I don't mean that the actual sample takes time. That new meter is like a minute and you know the water activity level. So it's really, really good. What I mean is to get a representative sample, I would need to take my entire batch, put it into an airtight container for a short period of time, a day or two, and then that way any moisture that might be in there has a chance to evenly distribute in that whole amount and then I can take my sample. For me it's easier just to dry it until no more weight will come out. Anyway, we'll get this restarted. Drain valves closed and I'm just going to put more dry time. Close the drain valve, I did. Continue and go. So we'll be back and check this in two or three hours. I'm going to add another hour in case I'm late. All right, so I put three hours on it and I can come back and check it in as little as two if I'm available. Otherwise, I'll let it go uh, longer. So don't go away. It'll be just a second. I'm back. It's actually been three hours and one minute. Uh, I had to add a time real quick. It was down to the last two seconds when I pressed more time. So it's in the cooling phase right now. So I need to get them out there of there quickly before they get cool enough to worry about condensation. And uh, we're all just about 100, about 95, 105, 100, and 85. So the top one's getting close to where I'd feel uncomfortable taking it out without rewarming it. And on my older model, there isn't a warm trays, so I would actually have to stop it and then restart it to get the heater to turn back on. So, let's get it stopped. Yeah, you can hear the ice cracking already because it's getting colder. Okay, I'll get the drain valve open, we'll get them out. So I've got the fans off, and we'll start with tray one, see how we're doing. Yeah, it's still warm, it's still pretty nice, but it's not near as hot as it was before. That one's a single gram also, so less than one half of one percent in three hours. I'm going to go ahead and take that out. Tray three, that one has no change. Perfect. I'm going to set it right there for a minute. And that one's a single one. So let me get these numbers. So I'm going to go ahead and stop that with no defrost and we'll get these moved over to the bagging area. So the time on the timer says 46 hours, about 46 and a quarter hours. I'm going to put that time for how much time it took because it did lose a teeny bit during that time. So on the average, so after I subtract the trays, the tear weight of the tray and, and parchment, there's about 210 grams of potato on each one of the trays. So if it had two grams, that would be 1%. People ask, at what point do I feel comfortable taking them out? Anything more than zero, I don't like. This was a three hour dry check, and I know from our past experience, with this kind of material, cooked potato, that if I give it more time, it's unlikely to lose anything more. So a single gram on three of the trays, two of the trays. A single gram on two of the trays in three hours, I'm confident that the next two hours will give us nothing additional. So I'm going to take them out. If it's something like a blueberry or a citrus, or cherries, something that's hard for the water to come out, I would probably, for, for one thing, I'd give it three or four hours of dry check, and then I would still leave them in for even longer if I had loss like that. But it's, so it's minuscule loss, so I'm going to have over 800 grams of food with two grams of loss. For those of you that have watched a bunch of these, you know usually I show the power meter also. Well, I forgot to reset it, so it's got a number that had nothing to do with this batch. It has to do with two previous batches and this one, because uh, I did another batch before and my sister did one before that. So I forgot about that, to reset that. So the number would have been worthless. Now let's go to the bagging. 
So I don't know if that shows up. Maybe I can zoom in on that. The difference between these two trays and these two trays. These are the ones that were cooked a little bit less than these. And you can see the powdery potato on the outside edge of these. So I'm going to bag these two sets separately. There was five pounds here when I first put them on the trays and there were five pounds here. I'm going to bag them that way. I'll do five one pound bags out of this set and five one pound bags out of that set. And when I talk about the bags, one pound bags, I'm always referring to, or almost always, I'm referring to the weight before they were dried because that's how we're going to use them later also. You can get a little bit of a feel for the difference between those two. These have kind of a soft look on the outside, kind of a mashed potato look on the outside, and these are much less so. My new seal just arrived today. We could get that open and check it out if I had something to open it with. Let's see if this ruler is sharp enough. Okay. Oh goodness, this new seal is completely different than the old one. Huh. It, that, that's a, I mean, wow. I, I don't know what to say. So it's easy to get sidetracked when you find something interesting, like that new seal being so different. It's quite interesting. Uh, 956, 949, 953, 961. So as I mentioned, we're going to bag tray one and two as one set and three and four as one set because of the differences of the potato. That way I can use them differently. So these first two trays total is 404 grams for the whole thing. And if we divide that by five to get back to five pounds, we need to bag them about 80.8 grams in each one pound bag. The second set were a little heavier, 424 grams, so 84.8 grams for each bag on that set. We'll go get some labels and put them on the bags. I need to figure out which bag that's going to fit in. So this will go into five bags. I'm assuming these will fit in a quart bag. Five quart bags should cover this. 80.8. And you can see that these potatoes are already coming apart because these are the ones that were cooked very well. I could actually use a smaller bag than this. Oh well, I labeled them now. I'm going to use these. Wish I'd paid attention. doesn't seem right. Did I make a mistake on this? What am I doing wrong? Jeez, I had the wrong set. These are the 84 gram ones. So I need to split this into these. Okay. Wasn't paying attention. I had the wrong set. So I need a fifth of these into the others. So I need 84. There we go. 84, eight. All right, so these are the well done ones. So I had them backwards. The other set is the 80. All right, so these get 80.8 grams each. All right, so we're really, really close. We'll just drop these in the other ones. I weighed those out as we went and I have an amount of water needed to rehydrate it to what it was before. And I have that in grams so I can use a scale. But of course, with water, 
grams and cubic centimeters and milliliters are all the same number. So I use grams because I'm most likely to put the things on the scale and weigh out my water. Now, you don't have to weigh this food going into bags. You don't have to weigh the water when you use it. But if I want to use this in a, in a beef stew or a stew or a soup or something, I might want to know the amount of water that I need to use to get these rehydrated back to what it was. So I've got a pot of soup and I like the thickness of it, but I want to add these. I need to add this amount of water with it so that it doesn't change the consistency. If you don't care, or you've got plenty of time, you could just add this and then slowly add the water you want until it gets the consistency you want to have. I like to just weigh everything. For one thing, then I can look at all my numbers and find out how much food I have stored. Otherwise, I would know that I had 100 bags, or in this case, 10 bags of these, but I might not have any information of how much food is that. So you don't have to weigh it, but I weigh it. Okay, now oxygen absorbers and we'll get them closed. And as I usually do, I'm using the 300 cc oxygen absorbers. I know that those are more than enough for these quart bags. It's more than enough for double that, as you saw in the test. Well, if you saw the testing. So I'll take one and, and these, these are not super full, so I can just drop them in. I don't have to worry about them being uh, stuck in the seal. When I have a taller amount in the bag, I like to tuck them down the side to make sure that I don't end up with them in the zipper or the seal. And I like to kind of slide them over as I go so I don't lose my place. And then I'm going to um, pull the bags close. And because these are not terribly fragile, I'm going to go ahead and kind of squish a little bit of extra air out. And of course you can use a vacuum to vacuum them out, but don't forget the oxygen absorber because vacuuming is not a substitute for an oxygen absorber. For two reasons. One, you won't vacuum all the air out of it. And two, air and oxygen is going to continue going through that bag. The oxygen molecules will go through that very slowly forever. But with that oxygen absorber in there and the fact that it can absorb more than twice this volume, it's going to be protected if any does or as oxygen gets through there. And these are the heavy seven mil mylar bags. These are going to resist oxygen transmission very, very well. And that's why I use the 7 mil ones. They're barely more expensive than the 5 mil ones. And I get a little bit lower oxygen transmission rate through them. Now we'll get them heat sealed. And with my sealer and these 7 mil bags, I have to use a setting of about six and a half. And with my sealer directly under the element is metal. So I do the first set twice to make sure that it gets up to temperature. So once and then one more right away. Okay, now I've got it sealed very high up on that bag. I've got room for two or three more seals in case I fail on that. I check it. I check very often to make sure that it's actually functioning. And then if you want a wider seal, you can do it two of them, one right above the other. So if you're not happy with a five millimeter, millimeter seal, you can go with 10 if you want to do. And then after it turns off, I wait for a couple seconds while it cools just a little bit. One last item before we have them ready for storage going to add the gross weight of each bag as it sets right now so I can tell if it ever fails. The one set that we had the one time that we uh, ran out of bags and bought some miscellaneous bags, they ended up letting water through, moisture through, to about 4%. So that would mean this would go up to about well, there's 80 something grams in there. So if that increased by 4%, 
um, be about three more grams. So this would go up by three grams. And we would be able to see that. And if it's changing between two numbers, we take the higher number. Then we're just going to write that number on the bottom corner of each bag, or I do the bottom corner. It doesn't really matter where. But that way we'll know if it ever has a problem. We'll know without opening it or checking it. Usually I let them set out for a day before I put them in the bins, and a lot of time it's just because I'm too lazy. So I don't get around to putting them into the bin until I get the next batch. I need to clear this table off to get the next batch in. It lets me see if all of these are collapsing down like they usually do after I put the oxygen absorbers in there. Now these are ready for long-term storage. Yeah, and these are the bags from a couple batches ago. Wanted to give a quick look at those. So these are the ones that I sucked some of the extra air out of. And you can see they just molded right to the stakes inside. These are the raw beef stakes, and it's just tight against there. This is one of the advantages of the 7 mil bags versus some of the lighter bags. If you use too light of a bag, you might also get punctures through that if you're having any sharp foods. Those are ready for storage, but I won't bother with them until tomorrow or the next day or whenever I get around to it. And I'll check them, make sure that they, all the oxygen absorbers are working. These will collapse down a bit for this set. And it's one of the advantages of letting it set for a day. If one bag or something does something different, we can address that and look at it. Well, here's the bags two days later. I can be pretty confident all of the oxygen absorbers are working. All of the bags are sealed well. And now when I put them in storage, they should be fine. You can see they've kind of form fitted to the food inside. They don't all go down this tight. It depends on the food, how much air you had in there to begin with, because it's only going to go down by 21%. So it may not always look like that. It depends on the food. But they all should go down by 21% and they should all look similar. All right, well, I'll leave it there. Thanks for watching and we'll see you on the next one. We're going to get those ap apples. Nope, potatoes. Uh, we're going to get the potatoes that we worked on a couple days ago. What day was that? Was that yesterday? Huh. I think it was yesterday. Uh, we're going to get the potatoes that we...